Thanks, though. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this new Talk Tech. So let's have a look at the topic of today. I will share my screen. So I see two topics for today, both from Christoph. So Christoph, if you want to start, Providence Checks 2.0. Mm -hmm. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's worth mentioning we are doing a warm up before we record. That is why everybody smiles in these meetings. Um, yes, so um, right now, uh, maybe to both topics like, like the provenance check and the ZIG store data is, is really just one topic. I don't know. Um, and I, I just do it again as a warm up uh, for further meetings. Uh, because from my point of view, we should discuss uh, how we handle provenance checks, right? So um, provenance checks for now, try to make sure that you're really um, installing the unchanged piece of software that you would like to install, right? So you, you tell something like, um, please install this and that package from this and that um, index. Um, the version is one, two, three, the um, SHA checksum is whatever it is. And uh, during uh, build somewhere, we can do TAMOS provenance. Is that correct? Francesco, Hashard, right? That, that is something in the S2I, in the build pipeline steps. And um, if we cannot validate the checksum, we're going to break the build in the best case. Um, I think the standard case is that we don't break the build just because of a checksum, because checksums are not very hard. They can be altered um, on the server side anyways. So it's not a very strong provenance checking here. We cannot really rely on the information. Mm. Uh, Sigstore and surrounding tools um, try to heal that situation by using a better uh, algorithm to provide uh, unchangeable checksums. They have something called uh, a Merkle tree, so it's basically a um, partitioning of checksums, and we do checksums on these partitions, and we aggregate them up in a tree, and blah, 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 blah. Um, technically, a better way to do all that stuff. Um, Problem here is um, none of the uh, Python packages uh, has SIG store signatures by now because there's no Python standard for that. So um, proposing to use SIG store um, signatures as a provenance check 2.0 is not really meaningful because no package has signatures. So for me, the question would be, um, can we can we create a piece of infrastructure which is basically aggregating the checksums as we have them right now? Aggregate if a package is providing six or checksums and um, turn, well, not turn, but add to the provenance check feature some kind of reporting feature so that we can tell developers, hey, um, your software stack consists of 100 packages, 75 of them. Um, have no six store signatures, uh, 25 of them have six store signatures. All the six store may be SHA checksum, like old fashioned, or six store checksum, new fashioned. All the signatures are okay, like, like a tiny report um, that we're going to use. Um, we could also do some based on that data, like if we aggregate. Um, the six store signature is available for index package version. We could also um, use that availability information as part of our advice. Right? If we have two um, TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever um, modules, one on the PyPI index, one on the AICVE index, and we provide a six store checksum for our PyTorch module, we could prepare prefer that in, in an advice. Stuff like that. Um, as I said, it's just uh, doing a little bit warm up. Let's uh, think about how we're going to use all that stuff. Um, how can we make 
provenance checks better? How can we handle this transition period from zero packages have six store signatures to 100% packages have six store mm, signatures? Can we do something good with, with some kind of reporting? Can we use the availability or non-availability of six store signatures in an advice? So the, these are the topics in, in my head regarding to that. Um, the uh, headline is basically um, make the software supply chain a little bit more secure. Um, if we know which packages go into a build, that's good. If we can prove the provenance of packages in a very strong fashion using SysStore, that is better. If we can prove that the build has happened on an on an good host, now we come to Tecton chains and stuff like that. Again, that is good. If we can prove that the the OpenShift node that ran the build ports has not been changed, has not been hacked, that is key lime. Again, that is a good thing. This way we can basically aggregate um, security information on different layers, like the application has been st statically um, uh, scanned, the libraries have been uh, scanned and we know where they are from, the build pipeline has been signed and secured, and the host infrastructure has been signed and secured. If you're gonna sum all that stuff up and put some nice labels on it, that's my super, super, super high level point of view, right? If we put some nice labels on the resulting parts that have been started from these container images, we can use um, the Red Hat Advanced Security Manager, or it is called Stack Rocks, I guess, um, to enforce um, these kind of policies. Keylime would go ahead and kill the pod if it has no good signatures. And um, the Red Hat Advanced Security Manager would, for example, report that there is a bunch of pods, a bunch of data scientists in your um, corporation that run their notebooks on, on not very secure data hub instances. That is, just to give you a super large picture and a super high level. I'm pretty sure there's a few details that I missed here, but that's uh, the idea. Maybe okay. I'm gonna maybe I'm gonna look up the um, the core repository because I think I also added an issue for the um, Red Hat Advanced Cluster. Uh, sorry, Red Hat Advanced Security Manager thing. I think okay. there is one action item which which is actually in progress, which is in regards to the Tecton chain. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I forgot the name, uh, but there is another person from the thread, if you would see. Uh, we, we are looking at Tecton chain and, and first having it deployed along with the Tecton pipelines on OPEC first. Uh, such, uh, so I'll give you a little context what Tecton chain does. So in Tecton pipelines, everything run as a task. So a single task means it's doing some operations. And so that operation is basically called as a task. So that's the terminology in Tecton pipelines. So Tecton chain, what it does, it's it's like a uh, it's like a monitoring service, and it's seeing or it's observing these tasks. And whenever there's a task run happening, it captures that information or captures the result of it or the or the the process running of it, and that's what it secures. So that's the function of Tecton chain. So right now, what we are trying to do is deploy Tecton chain along with Tecton pipelines on operate first so that it can start uh, capturing the results and the, the logs of uh, uh, the pipelines which are running right currently for all of our users and then take it from there to try to secure them. So right now we're in that process. The process is basically to first adjust the CR, CRDs into operate first so that can de so that can install uh, it, it uh, on operate first. The reason being, uh, why is because Tecton chains are not part of OpenShift pipeline yet, so we have to deploy it on your, on on our own. So that's why we are doing this process. So uh, there are a couple of issues uh, which are in AICV. I think someone already linked it. So that's the one we are trying to capture and to do. So it's in progress. It should be done this week, uh, uh, hopefully today or tomorrow, and 
it should be there by next week. So that is the first step we are trying to do in this uh, manner. And then it would be more in terms of changing the inputs or outputs of Tecton pipelines itself so that uh, it fits right into the Tecton chain is something which would be next focused on. But mm, one question. Mm -hmm. But the Tecton chain is another, OK, is another component, component. of Tecton. Yes. And you said this collecting the results of the tasks yes no matter but it's not linked to any tecton pipeline i mean or is it okay. like when i schedule a tecton pipeline there is also a tecton chain running yes so uh, we have to understand the the workaround uh, sorry the working process of this tecton itself so there are three components there's tecton pipeline there's tecton trigger and this is tecton chain all these have controllers which are running uh, behind. And whenever there's a interaction or a trigger, so if the first trigger goes to the Tecton trigger controller. It starts a trigger to Tecton pipeline controller, and that will start the pods, which we see uh, from the from uh, our permissions, which can see the pods. But actually, the controller is the one which is starting these things. Similarly, there would be Tecton chain controller, which is looking at the Tecton pipeline controller or the task which has been triggered. So it will just capture the results of Tecton task. So each task would be considered as its own uh, subset, and it should be taken into consideration. So that's why I was saying like the next focus would be to actually make it in such a way that we can use the results of Tecton chain, uh, which I'm also not aware of as, as of the moment. So I'm also reading on it. Uh, and uh, yeah, going Are that. we talking about uh, logs? Uh, I'm not sure if it's processes. only logs. I think it's the whole process which Tecton pipe task runs. If it was just logs, then it would have been uh, we, we could have done it with other uh, tools, yeah. but I think it's uh, something more in that sort. Because I think they also do authentication of this task, uh, and it's uh, described on the on the uh, documentation of Tecton chain itself. So you mean like you can authenticate who is who can run that? Task? Yeah, how what's happening there? Why why the chain has been started? If there are some keys inside it or a thing, I think st things like that. I am also not well versed with each and every aspect of it, but I'm I, I'm trying to read up on it and try to test that out. Okay, thank you. I mean, in the end, you can blame someone that um, the build um, is not OK, right? So um, Hashad is going to release an, um, a, a backdoor in the S2I toss, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we're going to track that change in Git, right? So Git knows Hashad committed all that stuff. We built that into a container image. And that, that build process will be signed. So. Um, um, we can really verify at some point in time we we really built that errors or that that hacker software that uh, Hashad created. Uh, again, that goes into a container image. We're going to sign that container image, and we in the end we know that we have run that um, piece of code. So it's basically a traceability thing. Um, I'm pretty sure. Um, even if we can um, have some logs uh, taken off the OpenShift cluster, they could be altered, right? Um, while we take the logs and send them to our log uh, thing, they, they could be changed. That is why they try to put the, the security measure by signing the whole Tecton pipeline run. So you know, OK, Tecton really executed all that stuff, and we're going to trust the cluster because it's the, the cluster, the controllers and um, uh, that are doing the work here. I, I wonder how, um, how that system looks in the end, but that is um, how I envision it will look like. Um, we can make sure that the software is good because we have all the Git commits. We can make sure that the build is good um, because we know for sure that nobody messed around with the build pipeline. Uh, we know that uh, the resulting container image is good because we have signatures. 
And as long as the X509 signatures don't break, everything is good. Yeah, I'm also wondering how, I'm still also reading about this and wondering how, how this looks like in the end, because at, at the moment we could start with this to, we, to apply this to our deliverables, let's say our images or our pipelines, right? And, and make sure that everything we deliver is signed and, and has, you know, six or signature. But if the components, I mean, the components there don't have signatures, we haven't been able to really, you know, verify the provenance of everything. And how how can one in the end, like an end user, distinguish between something that is, let's say, fully um, fully checked versus just partially checked, if you see what I mean. That's a question I have to myself. Yes, for me, that translates to um, do we have a reporting front end for all that stuff? So if I really look at uh, OpenShift, can somebody tell me which containers are OK and how they have been built from which Git commit? So is there? And in, in front end that can do the traceability for me and that can report on what's happening in my cluster. Um, I think we don't have that right now. And what the thing that uh, was introduced in QA is clear. Sync. No, it's not. Yeah. There was a something for six store in QA. Mm, don't think so. No. Mm. Might have read something, but okay. I had another link in that uh, uh, part. Uh, it was also described like it is also called provenance in the part of uh, Tecton chain. And it's, it has a markdown, which has all the information on how they are testing it. OK. Um, so if there is nothing more on this topic, we can move ahead. And uh, last words, I'll move ahead. So Arshad, the next topic is uh, utilize AI ops GitHub labeler in ThoughtBots. So uh, this was from the beginning of the summer internship. There was a project in, uh, which was initially a dot project, which uh, went to AIOps. There was GitHub labeler. Uh, this is basically like uh, taking any GitHub issues and be, or doing some ML on it, and then generating few labels through that and pro adding that level, label with the bot. So I got to know uh, recently that they have completed that task and it, it's an application now and it can run it can give you based on if you provided an issue json it will provide you labels for it so this is something which we had earlier spoken to uh yeah, ops folks and uh, we had thought about putting it in on, on circuit abvi which is an internal bot for tot station uh but now i thought maybe this is something we should discuss in a team and decide where to put this on uh, Pro would be a good place, but it needs little adjustment to make it a plugin. But uh, I was thinking maybe directly do it with the ASUCI uh, because uh, it's a it's a request and surf kind of uh, behavior. So Tecton can ask based because it it fetches the issue JSON itself. It can provide the issue JSON to this application, get the labels and attach them to that lab issue. Is something which I was thinking. Uh, so uh, any thoughts on that just to have a discussion on uh, what do you think about this uh, seems like a good feature to have uh, and also a uh, short note uh, the person who is working on this the intern he himself wants to be uh, who wants to contribute to the asuci it feels like a good task for himself to do this in the asuci and get from those with that that tecton pipeline 
Mm-hmm. I I wonder how we integrate that. Um, if you're talking about um, pipelines, we what we're we gonna do? We we receive a trigger on an issue, and then we add the labels, or do we? What do we do? So a pipeline has a task. Uh, so what we'll do is once the issue trigger is triggered, uh, we go to the task. Uh, we we have the JS the whole JSON in that task, so we can provide that JSON to this application via I don't know it's an app, API based application or is how what kind of application it is CLI based or anything. We basically take that image of this GitHub labeler, run that issue, provide that issue. Whenever it gives the list of labels, we can take that labels and it, uh, Tecton task itself has a web method to attach labels to GitHub. So we can add that and send the send the resulting webhook again to GitHub and it should add those label to GitHub issue. Seems like uh, one one mm-hmm. one task and it should do it. Let's try it. Um, I think I talked with uh, Michael Clifford about um, some kind of feedback. Um, uh, I wonder if if the bot is trying to apply labels, right? Um, and the human being, like like a day later or whatever, uh, resets uh, the labels that the bot set. Um, I think the one of the example notebooks uh, is talking about priority. Yeah, yeah it feels to me like a hard job to figure out the priority, right? Um, so it is very obvious that uh, a human being will reset the priority. How 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 can we give that feedback? Um, it might not be very meaningful for priority itself, but for something like a kind or area, it might be very valuable. Um, yeah. Like if, if we think it's, well, just a piece of documentation, the bot could learn from that re- reconfiguring or resetting the label from kind feature to kind doc. Same for area. Um, that would be interesting to, to see a path uh, forward, what these guys gonna do with that. But really just creating a tecton task from it, and and uh, go, I, I I think it's a good thing. That's a great point. Uh, if it's a feedback, then Tecton would be a little bit of hazard because it's stateless, so we cannot put what state it is. So we need to keep track of the ID of that issue, and uh, based on that, we would have to recompute or thing do to do things on that, which we can still do uh, going forward. Let's see. Uh, if not, then we already have a Python application called Safegetaf with that. That's fully state stateful. It has checking continuously what issue is running, so we can yeah. go back and to that. I don't know if we need a need a stateful application for that um, because um, I mean state is saved in Git anyways, right? So um, for for every pull request that we're going to send through the pipeline, and if we um, feed back uh, labels to the pull request or to to an issue. The state is saved in in Git, it, uh, yeah. GitHub itself. Um, so maybe it's just a cron job to learn from from human interaction with the issue or the, the pull request. But anyway, um, um, I think I, I talked to Michael about that um, before. So maybe it's worth uh, heating that question up again. Sure. Anyway, so uh, what is the name of uh, the intern? Anthony. Anthony. I think that's okay. Um, pronounced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to ask him if uh, he creates a Tecton task, right? Yeah, yeah we, okay. he was interested in contributing to the whole the application itself. So it would be a good first issue because it's not touching any other components, just a single new pipeline, which is doing exactly. Thing. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, that's about it from this. Time. Thank you, Ashar. Okay. Um, I don't see other topics for today. Uh, so... Wait, here's another one that just came to my mind. Um, damn it. Uh, we could uh, fix the GitHub labeler. Let's see. It seems like um, the GitHub labeler issue uh, repository itself has some issues with uh, Kabishet. Maybe uh, we can have a look at that one. Um, I don't know what that means. Feels like they're using some no good module. Oh, it's uh, this one. 
I think I, Kevin mentioned it already. We cannot handle. It's editable. It's not no, no, because. Uh, yeah, there is no package. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think I blocked about why editable in a containerized context makes absolutely zero sense anyways. It's part of the template. Maybe we should remove it from the template. It was a, it was a topic of a talk, or I think it was a topic of a blog which you wrote. Just talk. Yeah, um, it's part of the template. What do you mean by part of the template? All the projects come from the IOPS template, and the template has that. So every project you create basically cannot be handled by Kebishet. Makes okay. sense? <laughs> uh, wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Makes absolutely zero sense. But um, I guess they need to do it because they are they are running the Jupyter notebook and they have that source directory and they're gonna fiddle around with Python modules in that source directory. They want to use that from within the notebook. Therefore, we need to have it as as a module. Uh, yeah, but we cannot. I mean, either we should do something or yes, we should do something. Um, maybe warn like. No, they should completely get rid of that pattern, actually. I wonder how, how is... Um, I mean, it's okay for development, probably, but when you want to move to application, maybe not. No, it's not okay for development, because for development, you can simply... I mean, if you're creating your own Python module, you shouldn't do it like that. Um, yeah, you should have another repo, create a module. Maybe, yes. yes. Or, it's a Python... Well, uh, no, it should be, I mean, the editable part should be not in packages, but in dev packages, right? If it's for development? Yes. Yeah. Great point. Um, in that case, Kebeshet should not fail, I guess, unless you ask for the, the, the dev to be included. Okay. Um, Let's see what we're going to do with it. I, I'm going to create an issue for it. Um, to me, it feels like uh, we need a new way how we implement that pattern, right? I can understand that if you're sitting in your Jupyter notebook and you create a Jupyter module for all your stuff, you want to do that somehow. Um, but it feels like it is one of these topics where we need to educate the data scientists to be a little bit more software engineers. Because again, in the end, an editable module in a container really doesn't make any sense. Because, I mean, there's nothing to edit here. It's meaningful for the development phase, but not, not any further. Yep. From point of uh, package dependencies, if, if, if it's like, for example, here, the source is editable, and when it gets locked, it is still source, right? There's no de direct dependencies out of source, right? So can we skip from Kebishet, like these kind of thing, and still lock the file? Because technically, there's nothing else to, to lock. And it's and the dependencies would be just the the resolution would be just from the other, pa other, other packages in that stack, right? And this is just an additional add to it. Is that correct, assumption? I guess no, because of the ash, right? Right. The ash pip file pip file lock as different needs okay. to be yes. But I mean, if we suggest that you should not use that, or if it's I know even yeah no yeah right. So even in development, the the issue persists because the ash is created from all the pip files. Um, feels to me like we should figure out why why they are doing it like this, right? Um, I imagine they have some stuff in that source directory which is pure Python, 
they want to hide it from from the data scientist point of view because they don't want to include all that python in a notebook um is it really a good way forward is it is it something that we can do better with using elira notebooks is that embedded in the elira environment or or can we get completely rid of it well in theory, whatever you have in that source should be created by some package, right? Uh, no, it is created by the human being, isn't it? Yeah, but unless you're using some... So in that source, you are basically doing some Python code. So you are already using some dependencies. So what is the point of included also that if that Python yeah. script that you created is going to run anyway, if you have all the dependencies in the pip file. Uh -huh. Let's see why they do it and how they use it. Maybe, um, Francesco, you can go ahead with Michael and figure out why it's in there. I don't know who, who put it in there, but you can, you can have a look. History. <laughs> Even even better blame was Tom. Tom. <laughs> Maybe he was just a proxy for somebody else. Okay. Uh, anyway, created an issue um, in that uh, AI COE AI ops project template repository. Um, yes, and the issue is uh, linked. Of course not. Is it? No. No, no, no. I mean the issue you provided. I think. There is also another one, uh, I don't remember where. Uh, I think where Kevin answered already. Okay. Okay, then I will look for it. Okay. Um, thank you. Do you have other topics for today? Otherwise, uh, thank you very much and uh, see you next time. Thank you. See ya. Bye. I don't know, stop recording. Bye. Okay.